Well, good morning, Broadway Baptist Church, and welcome to our virtual service this morning. My name is John, I'm the kids pastor, and I am so excited and happy to welcome you to our service this morning. I just have a couple of quick announcements before we jump back into worship. Uh, the first one today, if you are a graduating senior or a college graduate this, uh, this May, uh, we know that things have been a little bit weird with the, the pandemic and there are a lot of uh, graduation ceremonies that are being postponed or, or changed. We want you to know that we also want to celebrate you. So if you are a graduating senior or a graduating college student uh, this spring, please visit our website. Scroll all the way down to the bottom on the front page. There's a questionnaire that we'd like you to fill out. We are going to have a dedicated Sunday sometime this summer. We will get in touch with you and let you know exactly when that is, but we will have a dedicated Sunday where we will celebrate you and your accomplishment of graduation this year. Congratulations, graduates. We are proud of you. Also, happy Mother's Day, moms. We are so, so thankful for you. If you have a mom and she's in the room with you, Turn around and tell her how much you love her and how glad you are for her. This is what the Bible has to say about moms. It starts out, this is in Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, I'm going to read verse 10 and then uh, a few verses later. A Who can find a wife of noble character? She is more precious than jewels. Okay, and it goes on to say later, she watches over the activities of her household and is never idle. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Have you been blessed by your mom? She is a gift from God, and you need to thank God for her and also thank her. Take some time and, you know, love your mom today. Love your mom every day, really. Uh, but we are so excited that you guys are here. Moms, happy Mother's Day. Graduates, congratulations. Don't forget to fill out that form on our website. And we look forward to seeing you guys, to, to seeing everyone on our campus very, very soon. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy our worship. Good morning. I'm excited to be with you today to give you another update from the pastor search committee. But before I do that, I would like to say happy Mother's Day. We pray that all of you have a great day celebrating the special ladies God has given us. And to mothers, thank you. We love you and happy Mother's Day. So for the update, um, several weeks ago, we gave you an update and we committed as a pastor search committee to you to stay in communication with our pastoral candidate. We told you that God had revealed uh, a man 
to us that we had called in view of a call to come and preach for Broadway um, to be the next pastor of our church. And we committed to you that w at least weekly we would communicate with this, uh, this pastor. And I want to tell you that we have done that. Um, as the chairman of the committee, I've been able to speak on the phone with this candidate at least once a week, sometimes more than once a week. Uh, but at least weekly, we have had a, a great phone conversation. We've exchanged emails. We've exchanged text messages. So every week since our last update, we have been able to communicate with this pastoral candidate multiple times a week. We have discussed numerous things. We've talked about our families. We've talked about our church families, the ministries where we are, um, our communities and what's going on in each one of those. And we've also kind of looked to the future. Um, laid out some some possible timelines and just kind of dreamed about what God uh, may do here in the coming weeks. Um, this past Wednesday night, the pastor search committee had a meeting, and we were able to video conference this pastoral candidate into our meeting. It was fantastic for all of us to be able to see his face and to hear his voice and just to hear what God's doing where he is in the church that he currently serves. I will tell you that where he lives, the state that he lives, has um, loosened restrictions a little sooner than we have here. And with that being said, his church was able to meet for the first time since the pandemic hit last Sunday. On May the 3rd, they came together and met, and he shared just positive words about the people that were there and, and, and just how wonderful it was to be able to come together as a church body and worship. I understand that these are uncertain times. We all have felt that over the past six to eight weeks. And in that, we've, um, I've heard some people, a little anxiety about with all the delays that we're experiencing, how does that affect us moving forward? Is there hesitancy on either side? Is there um, maybe second thoughts? I want to tell you unequivocally, the pastor search committee, we are full steam ahead. This pastoral candidate that we have called in view of a call, he is 100% committed. He and his family both are excited about what God is doing and the possibility of him becoming the next pastor of Broadway Baptist Church. So, no need to be anxious, no need to be worried about the delays. God is doing great things in, in both sides and we're excited to continue to move forward in this process. So, several weeks ago, on the update that I gave you, we kind of spelled out what uh, the next weeks would look like, and I told you that our plan as the pastor search committee would be that the first week we came together as a congregation, we would call a business meeting. Church bylaws state that a uh, business meeting has to be called in, in two weeks advance of the meeting. So this past week, you all received an email from church leadership spelling out what the next weeks looked like and how we were gonna come back together. Now, Lord willing, we are gonna to come together as a church on Sunday, June the 7th. And we are so excited to be able to come back together and see you. So our plan as a committee is on June the 7th, we will call a business meeting that will be scheduled for two weeks later, and that would be June the 21st. On June the 14th, as a pastor search committee, we plan on taking some of our worship service and introducing this candidate to you, introducing his family to you, giving you some information about him, and just giving testimony about how God brought him to us, how God revealed him to us, and how God confirmed that this was the man that he was calling to Broadway Baptist Church. So that would take place on Sunday the 14th. So now on June the 17th, which is a Wednesday, our goal would be to have this pastoral candidate on our campus to give um, a testimony, to give a, just a time of testimony, uh, a time of vision casting for, for how he feels he would lead Broadway into the future. Um, and, and just a time of testimony to share how God has brought he and his family to this point. That would be on Wednesday night. And then we would do the exact same thing on Saturday, June the 20th. We understand that everyone may or may not be able to attend on Wednesday, June the 17th. So we will do the exact same thing on June the 20th. Testimony, vision casting, and just a word from this pastoral candidate. Uh, you're welcome to come to both. 
but that will be the same type of meeting on Wednesday the 17th and Saturday the 20th. And then on Sunday, June the 21st, um, we would have this pastor in our service. He would preach to us in view of a call, and we would vote for this man to become the next pastor of Broadway Baptist Church. And we are so excited about that opportunity. Now, we understand that some of you may not be comfortable coming together in corporate worship on June the 21st. Some of you may be uncomfortable. Some of you may not be able to come because of health concerns. Some of you may have little ones that you can't or, or don't want to bring into a worship service, and we understand that. Um, you know that that Sunday morning, in view of a call uh, that the pastor will be here, that will be broadcasted as normal. We will actually broadcast uh, the time of testimony and vision casting that he shares with us on Wednesday the 17th and on Saturday the 20th. And we are working diligently. We are discussing ways that each voice be heard, that each voice be, counted, uh, be counted. Some way, somehow, we will make sure if you're not able to be in the service on Sunday, June the 21st, that your voice and your vote is counted. So, in closing, I want to share some scripture with you. Psalms 130, verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. I'm not sure about you, but I'm not very good at waiting. But I want to encourage you in the same way the Lord encouraged me earlier this week. While we wait, God is working. God is working all things together for the good of those that love him. God's timing is perfect. God's will is perfect. And we are trusting him in that. Our pastoral candidate is trusting him in that. And we're asking you to trust the Lord's timing and the Lord's will in all of this. Please continue to pray. Pray for us as a committee. Pray for your church leadership. And pray for our pastoral candidate. Pray for our community that all these things will come together at the perfect time. And on Sunday, June 21st, we will be able to hear from this man of God and be able to vote on him becoming the next pastor of Broadway Baptist Church. Thank you for allowing me to share. We're excited to be back with you and to see you soon. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Good morning, church. Uh, it's so good to be with you again today. And I want to say Happy Mother's Day. Uh, it's a special time for us to be together this morning to honor our mothers and, uh, and to sing together to praise the Lord for all his blessings. Um, not only that, but because of who he is and what he's done for us uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's sing together uh, 10,000 Reasons. Let's sing together. Bless the Lord.
the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and live forevermore. Sing it, church, just bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship this soul. Oh, 
back foot in line. I don't deserve still you give yourself away Holy overwhelming never ending reckless love Church oh how he loves us so Jesus loves us so much. He laid down his life for us. Let's sing this verse. Of this beautiful hymn. My Jesus, I love. I church, we say that if ever we love thee, Lord Jesus, it is right now in this moment where you have sustained us. And not only have you sustained your church in this time, but you've called us to become greater. You've called us to become more, to do those works which you've called us to do before you left this earth, but not to stay gone, Lord, but to come back eventually to to rapture your church and to take us with you so that one day in mansions of glory, when we sit and think about the wonders and miracles of who you are, we will worship you for all eternity, forever. So right now we say, God is your church. We want to live with urgency, God, that your gospel, Lord Jesus, would 
would flow from our mouths and flow from our actions, and that people would come to know you as their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because that is how we glorify you the most in this age we are living. Father, I pray that you would be with Dr. Mikey. Preach through him, Lord, your word, which never returns void. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Broadway Baptist Church and friends. It's so good to be with you today. I'm so grateful that you've tuned in on this Mother's Day. Of course, Mother's Day is a wonderful day for all of us to celebrate all the moms that are out there today. You might be a mom that's watching this service with us today or taking part in this, and we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. Of course, taking care of little ones is not easy, and carrying a child for up to nine months or more is not easy at all. And so uh, we definitely want to thank you for everything that you've done, and we want to celebrate you today. And so um, everyone that's watching this today, there's something unique about all of us. We all have a mother. Uh, somebody that has given birth to us, and we're in this world because of that person, and we can say we're grateful. And so to all the moms who are out there, uh, we love you. God bless you, and I, I hope that today's message really does excite you and uh, blesses you during this time. Of course, we're in a different type of setting with the coronavirus, and of course, we're trying to be careful to make sure that everyone is safe and everyone's protected, and and you'll hear more about that in weeks to come, how we're going to be working through this pandemic and, and continuing on into phases of opening up. But we just want to tell you we love you. We love all of our families. And uh, let's definitely celebrate the mothers today. And so, um, and so I, I love this day in particular because I get to recognize my mom and, uh, of course, my wife. And, and I'm so grateful for all that they have done. I'm grateful for my mom, Mama Rose, who has raised me and poured into my life. Life and, and she has been a great godly example for our family. Uh, but also, I'm so grateful for my wife, Emily. She has been an incredible mother to Wesley, and it has been a joy to really be alongside of her in this journey as, as she carried Willow Wesley and then, of course, taking care of him in such a great way. And, and we're just training him, training him truly to be a warrior of the Lord. And I pray that all the moms and dads out there are doing the same thing. But I love this day. I want to, I want to tell you a story that happened a few years ago that was very unique for me. I don't know why. I, I, had, um, I, I always like to get my mom something for Mother's Day, and I try to anyways. And so what we what we do is either send flowers to her or I've sent flowers to her. But a couple of years ago, I, I decided to do something different and uh, I found this message in a bottle and it was a message of encouragement. So I sent her this message in the bottle and she received that. She, she, got, the, she got the gift and then she called me, um, at, I guess it was a few days later, and said, I want to tell you something. I needed a message in a bottle. I needed an encouraging message this year. I didn't need flowers necessarily. I didn't need just another gift that uh, that that we could possibly get, but I needed a, a word of encouragement. And my hope is today that this message for our moms especially is an encouragement, but I also pray it's an encouragement for all of us because I know it has spoken to me and, and I know it will speak to you. So happy Mother's Day. So glad that you're with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to study the word of God. We thank you so much for Broadway Baptist Church. The joy it is to worship with one another. We might be in different places. We might be in our homes. We might, uh, we might be in, a, in an office. We might be somewhere, um, maybe even in our car. But we're watching this today. And we really care about hearing from you today, Lord God. That's what we're desiring to do. And so we come to you with a, a hungry heart to know more about you. And Lord God, we ask a special blessing upon all of the mothers today. We want our mothers to receive receive a blessing directly from you, straight from you, a, a, a blessing of, of course, strength and, and, and the joy and the peace and the love that you give. And so thank you, Lord God, that we have all these blessings in Christ Jesus. But I definitely pray for a special blessing upon our moms today. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to share with you a message I've entitled The Blessings of a Godly Mother. Now, before the dads out there or the single folks uh, or the children decide to tune me out on this, don't get caught up in the title. I think the title is important for us, but I think there's a lot in the lesson for all of us. But the blessings of a godly mother, it, it, it really speaks to, to this lesson today. And we're going to be uh, uh, talking about a specific lady, and you'll hear more about her a little bit later on. I want to read to you the text. It's in Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. It reads, So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is a significant passage because uh, it, it's a little off topic of our, our going verse by verse through the book of Philippians. But what is happening in this passage is the start of the church in Philippi. So it goes along with what we're doing. And I thought that you would uh, really get a lot of joy out of seeing how the church at Philippi really started because it started with a lady a lady named Lydia. And that's why I thought this was an appropriate lesson for today. Um, uh, she is a woman who is a godly woman, a woman who's walking with the Lord. But before we get into her life, let me give you some background on what's going on in this city called Philippi. It's a Roman colony, okay? So it's run and the policies there are given and the laws that are given are Roman. And so that's how everybody is living. It was a very wealthy city because it was a trade city, but they, there was gold, there's mining for gold and, and silver in, in the areas surrounding this town and also in this town. It was a major trading center uh, because the roads that ran through it uh, were popular roads, and you'll see that in just a moment, but major trade center at the top of the Aegean Sea in Macedonia, which we know as Greece. It's the gateway between Asia and Europe. And the reason it's the gateway, it's because of uh, major roads. And one of the major roads is called the Ignatian Highway. It's the east and west route. It's a trade route. It's a place that is um, heavily populated with uh, travelers. And of course, people coming in and out to do business. The Apostle Paul would have traveled on this road as well. Philippi was exempt from paying taxes. This is what made it also um, such a desirable place to not only live, but to do work in because it was Roman. It was protected by the Romans. It was um, uh, led by the Romans. It was, uh, um, I guess you would say, uh, the leadership was Roman in general. And so they really cared about their cities, but they didn't have to pay taxes to live there. 
because it was uh, it was a special city that that did so much for uh, many other places. And so people wanted to live here. They cared about it, and it was a wonderful place of of commerce, if you want to put it that way. All right, now I want to give you the uniqueness of the church at Philippi because this is very special for all of us studying the book of Philippians. Now, we I shared this probably in the first message that I taught at Broadway Baptist Church on um, on Philippians, but I think it's important for us to look at. It, number one, is the first Christian church in all of Europe. Paul started the church, he planted the church, and it will start with a woman named Lydia. But this is the first Christian church in Europe. The Philippian church was the poster church for other fellowships. Paul refers to this in other epistles, but he makes sure that the Philippians know that they are doing it right. The book of Philippians is written like a thank you letter. Thank you so much for guys like Timothy and, and Epaphroditus, for these people and, and, and for the care packages that I've received. Paul is telling them, thank you for what you've done. You've done it well. And then these Christians defined biblical fellowship. They were the ones who really taught other churches how to do what we would say is koinonia. It's this idea of right fellowship, godly fellowship, not just a gathering of people, but a gathering of people who are worshiping God the way he's called them to worship. This was a true example of a church, a church that's doing it well. I think uh, the church at Philippi is a great example for all churches to say, hey, they're doing it well. Uh, they're, they're helping others. They're sending out um, packages for people. They're sending out missionaries in different ways. But they are people who care for one another. They love God. They're willing to give it all for the Lord. And, and so it's a great book for us to know about and for us to study. Now, it's also important because the gospel is being spread or is spreading to Europe and, and being the first church, the first European Christian church, if, if I might say that, um, it, it's unique. How did it all begin? How did that start? Well, it started in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Look at what happened in the life of Paul. Paul is is converted on a road to Damascus. We know this wonderful conversion takes place in Acts chapter 9, and Paul is radically saved. He is changed from the inside out, but I want you to see what the Lord says to Ananias. But the Lord said to him, go for he, go to this man, go to this man named Paul, who was named Saul, but his name's been changed to Paul. Go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry, here it is, my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now this is very unique because the disciples thought early on that, this, that the message of the gospel was coming directly to the Jews. And they're, they're right in that. Of course, the gospel has come first to the Jews, but then it's going to go to the Gentiles. And God chose to use the Apostle Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And that's what he's saying here about him. This is his life. This was the change that took place. So the gospel would not only go to the Jews, but now it was going to the Gentiles. And you'll see just in a few chapters later, right? Just in a few chapters later, 15 and 16, we're seeing the gospel go to Europe, to the Gentiles. So Paul was chosen to go to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, when he goes into Europe, he's, he meets this, uh, this, these group of, this group of women that are doing it right. They're worshipers of God, but there's a significant person in that group, and her name is Lydia. She is a devout woman who is following God. And I want to use this lesson to talk about her because the characteristics that she has are the same characteristics that all of us should have as, uh, as children of God. And, and so, of course, we're going to focus in on godly women here, and we're going to say we're so grateful and so thankful, but this has an application for all of us. And so as you listen to this lesson today, my hope is that you just take it to heart and say, you know what? I can be just like that. I can be a person who is all in. All right. 
Now, first, what do we see about uh, Lydia and these other women? They were uh, prayer warriors. They were praying people. It says in Acts 16, verse 13, And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where, we're, where we suppose there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So there was more than one woman there. There were women that were there. And they were coming together to pray. Now, why was Paul doing this? Well, here's the deal. If there wasn't a synagogue in the area, if there wasn't a place of worship per se, what people would do is they would go to the riverside to worship down by the riverside. And so they would go there and worship. Jews were known for doing this or people that wanted to worship God like the Jews. This is what they were doing. And so when Paul, the apostle Paul came to a city, he would go directly to the synagogue. Now, let me show you this because here's the apostle Paul going to the riverside. He speaks to these women, but in Paul's missionary journeys, it was so unique because um, he would stop at a synagogue in each town if it had one. Why? Because he always seemed to go to the Jew first. Now that's biblical, right? Of course, Jesus Christ came to the Jew first, and then of course the Gentiles will come into the faith as well. And he actually says, when I am lifted up, and talking about being on the cross, Jesus said, I will draw all men unto myself. He's making it very clear. I've come to the Jew, but also, also through my actions, I'm going to open. I'm going to really take the veil from top to bottom, tear it apart so that anyone can come to the holy place, can actually come to holy of holies. And who is the holy of holies? Or who is that person who's holier than all? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can come to him because of what he did, tearing down the barrier that separated us between us and God. Jesus Christ was the atoning sacrifice that allowed us to come directly to the Father, but only it had to be done through him. And so what the Apostle Paul was doing is coming to the Jew first, letting them know, hey, the Messiah has come. You've been looking for him. He's come. Many Jews didn't listen to him. Many Jews didn't follow him. Many Jews didn't care about his message. But what happened? Whoever listened to the gospel and trusted Christ was welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so he went to share the gospel with anyone really who would listen. In Philippi, he found women praying. He found prayer warriors this was a daily routine of people who were worshipers of God. They worshiped God. Now, when we think of a prayer warrior, we know this, right? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So here is a group of women that are praying, praying and trusting God every day. They may not even know really what what the Bible is all about, right? The Bible is being written at this time anyways, so they don't know uh, the, uh, the, the full extent of God's word. They don't know the mysteries revealed yet that the apostle Paul is going to reveal to them. They don't know all of that. But what they're doing is they're faithful with what they know. They're faithful with the light that they have been given and they're praying and they're focusing on God. This reminds me so much of Cornelius or uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. These people were worshipers of God. And what God did was he showed himself to them. He made himself so clear to them. I want to give you a quote. Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? You know, a spare tire happens to us and it seems like every, our day is shot and that's when we need all the help we can get. So we, uh, we, we cry out for help at that time, right? Well, that's not what the Bible tells, uh, says to us about prayer. It says, no, pray daily. Pray daily. Pray without ceasing. Be a person of prayer. I love it because Lydia is not just praying for her physical needs. She's in a daily routine of seeking the Lord. The Bible says she was a worshiper of God. 
This is how we need to be. I want you to see next that she was called a hard worker. It says in verse 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. So we see here that she was a seller of purple goods. Now that's interesting. I, I love this picture, by the way, because it's uh, you can't see the woman's face, right? I love when there are pictures and you really can't see the face of the person because it's really about Christ, isn't it? It's all about Christ. But you know this about this woman, that she was uh, she was a seller of purple goods. And, and um, Lydia is probably a Phoenician name. Um, there's a lot of different thoughts on this. We may not even know. It might just be a, a kind of a nickname that Paul gave her at that time, just saying where she was from. But because um, uh, we don't really know fully. But Lydia, probably a Phoenician name, a native of Thyatira, a Macedonian colony. Of course, we know that is in Greece. Um, Lydia was a worker of cloth. The water in Philippi was perfect for dyeing material. Unique purple dye brought the city universal renown. So it was big business. She was a, um, I, we could call her an entrepreneur in this, but she was really just a seller of purple uh, garments and, and things that were, uh, seemed to be high dollar, things that were sought after. People wanted these and they would travel far and wide to get there to get these very things. And so um, Lydia was probably known for her ability to sell these beautiful garments because the scripture makes note of that. And if the scripture takes note of something like that, it's probably a, a, a pretty significant deal for, for her. And so here she is, and she is a hard worker. Now, when I first see this, and I see this in Acts chapter 16, in verse 14, I want you to know, I quickly think about the Proverbs 31 woman. And you've probably heard about the Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, this lady was a, a person who was devoted to the Lord, devoted to her family, devoted to her work, taking care of the house as, as, as uh, God gave her strength to do so. And, and of course she knew, she, had, she saw the bigger picture. And I see this woman in a similar light as the Proverbs 31 woman, a person who's working hard. Um, she's doing all that she knows to do, right? But then when the gospel of Christ comes to her, life changes, right? But, but we'll get to that in just a moment. I want you to see this next. Number three, she was a worshiper of God. So that's what it says. It says, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. God. What was a worshiper of God or who was a worshiper of God? It was a person who knew what the Jewish writings were. Now, if you read the book of Hebrews, we know very clearly that in the past, God spoke to the forefathers through the prophets and he spoke to them in different kinds of ways, right? We know that. But then in these last days, he has come and spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. But people during this time, that knew the scripture or knew Old Testament scriptures. They knew that a Messiah was to come. They knew that we were to fear God. They knew that we were to trust God. God is faithful. We need to be faithful. And she believed it. And she believed the writings of the word of God up until what she had, right? So that's what's going on with her. Now, here's some thoughts that probably you should think about as well when you're thinking about Lydia. We don't know whether Lydia was a Jew of Jewish descent. We don't know that. But it is evident that she was a Jewish proselyte. In other words, she had heard how to worship God. And that was given by Jewish writings because that's that's who it was given by, right? The prophets were Jews. Uh, the disciples were Jews. We can go into all of this. The, the, the priests were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. We can go on all that. But um, she would have fall, fallen in line of that type of uh, fear of God or that type of worship of God. In spite of all her secular obligations, she found time to worship God according to the Jewish faith. Daily, she made her way to the riverside, riverside to pray with other worshipers of God. And so she was a big part of worship or worship was a big part of her, her routine. And so I think this is important for us. So we see that she's a worshiper of God. Then I want you to see this. And this is where a lot changes. She was a humble servant of the Lord. She comes unto the Lord. Look what it says in verse 14. One who heard 
us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, sold of purple goods and was a worshiper. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Humble servant of the Lord. Here's why I say that. Because she put herself under the teaching of the word of God. We know that because she was already a worshiper. She had already, um, she had already found the way to serve God, to trust God, to listen to God. But then in this unique passage, something happens where God opened her heart to, to take in or to receive what Paul was telling her because this was new to her. And this was probably new to all the people around her. They had not heard this before. And so they needed, she was seeking the Lord, but she needed to know more. And I love this, uh, this word of, of to pay attention. In the Greek, it's the idea of beware of something or to be cautious about something. Also to, to be attentive towards something or to hear it well. Hear it for the first time in the way that you can understand it and respond to it and then be able to devote yourself to it. So that's what's happening there. Now, I want you to see a couple passages passages about this because a lot of people take that, that passage that the Lord opened her heart and they go all kinds of avenues with that theologically, right? Doctrinally and all that kind of thing. We need to be careful and make sure we know what the Bible's saying about these types of things. And Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart. Well, let's put it this way. Lydia, along with these other women, I would say the Ethiopian unit, Cornelius, these type of people, they were worshiping God with all their heart. They were seeking God with all their heart. And you know what? The Lord revealed himself to them. He does it over and over and over and over again. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. And that's what's happening. And they found him. And God put her in a totally different understanding. It, it's kind of like when I came to know Christ and you came to know Christ. It's, you knew about Christ, right? You knew about him. But then when you came to know Christ or, or, or when you gave your life and surrendered your life over to Christ, all of a sudden your eyes were opened up. It's like the Apostle Paul. His eyes were opened up. And there's a physical aspect to Apostle Paul too, right? Remember that when he was radically changed on the road to Damascus, scales came upon his eyes and he was blinded. And then his eyes were opened so that he could see clearly. That was a physical thing for the Apostle Paul, but it was also a spiritual thing for the Apostle Paul. Because a lot of people think that they have to see it completely before believing will ever take place, Right? But that's not necessarily the case. What, what happens here is they're seeking God with all their heart. And as they sought the Lord, he opened their eyes to see his goodness. And God does that. I feel like every day the Lord is opening me, my eyes to new things. I don't know if you feel that way, but that is, that is one of the ways that I feel. I feel like the Lord God is opening my heart to his goodness every day. And that's what's happening with Lydia. She is seeing the Lord in his goodness. And I don't think it was just in that moment. I think it continued on throughout her life. I want to show you a couple other passages that would help us understand this, this uh, Acts chapter 16 passage. Hebrews 13 or 315. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. The apostle uh, that is, uh, well, a lot of times think the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. We don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. And so I'd be happy to talk to you about that because um, I think it's a wonderful discussion. And sometimes I just say the Apostle Paul wrote, but we really don't know. And, um, and it is, it's a fascinating study. But the writer of Hebrews said here, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. He's talking to Hebrews there and he's telling them, don't close off to God. Don't close off to the word of God. Don't do that. Instead, open your hearts. He goes on, verse, uh, uh, we see it in, in, in 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called the day so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. This is a great passage for all of us to see because 
He's saying you have the right to turn away from God. The scripture, the scripture can be revealed to you, but you can turn away from it. You can know the truth and suppress the truth. You can exchange the truth for a lie. But when you hear the truth and you understand it like Lydia did, she didn't run from it. She didn't turn away from it. She, said, she gladly accepted it and embraced it and said, yes, I trust this teaching. And that's what's going on with her. So we see that there. And then godly influence in the home. This is so exciting, right? Verse 15 reads, And after she was baptized and her whole household as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, I want you to look at that first little part. And after she was baptized, so, so she truly responded to the Apostle Paul. She turned her life over, surrendered her life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now she has this new understanding, this new knowledge. God has opened her heart to see it, opened her eyes to see it. And she believed it, trusted in the Lord, surrendered her life over. She was baptized. And then it says her household as well. <laughs> I got to show you this passage that goes along with this type of thinking. And hey, it's in the same chapter. So that's pretty unique. Acts 16, verse 31 through 33. I want you to see this great uh, record of Paul being in jail and leading a jailer to the Lord. But look what it says. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour uh, of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and his and all his family. There's a significant part of that passage, right? You can see it with me. It's found in that verse 31. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus. You and you will be saved and you and your household. Well, that just means that once a person is saved, they become a huge influence in the home. They influence the home greatly. They bring Christ into the home. You know, when a person gives their life to Christ and Christ is in them, wherever they go, they are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So Christ is dwelling with them, going wherever they go. So a true, sold out believer in Christ who was living by the word of God and obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what's happening in their home? Everyone that's in that home is seeing Christ face to face. They're seeing the works of Christ. They're hearing the words of Christ. I'm talking about a believer who's walking uprightly. And they are tremendous influencer in in their home. And that's exactly what's going on in the life of Lydia. It's like this family here in this picture. They They are studying the word of God. Lydia was a person who not only received Christ, received the word of God with gladness and and was willing to do anything that the Lord called her to do, but she brought it home to her family and they they were changed because of it. I sometimes wonder, is my family changed because of my life in Christ? Has my family truly been impacted by my relationship with the Lord God Almighty? And I want to say that not, uh, we can definitely say that for our workplace and, and being a student in school and what, anything like that. But what about our home? What about our family? What about our extended family? Has our family been changed because of our relationship with the Lord God Almighty? I think this helps us to understand passages like Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, if you think about all the training that goes into teaching a child, you know, (laughs) we're we're about to start the process of potty training. You know what's going to be very valuable for potty training is that little Wesley is going to have that with him his whole life. He's learning how to eat. We've taught him how to eat with a fork, with a spoon. He can take those abilities throughout his whole life and he can learn how to, he knows how to eat. 
He knows how to use the restroom. He'll know how to do that. He will know how to treat people. He'll know how to say thank you and, uh, and, and you're welcome. And um, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, things like this because we're training him how to do those things. How much more important is it for us to train the very aspects that have eternal value, the, the, the very concepts, the very teachings, the very doctrines that really matter for eternal life? Man, if we train him in those things now, along with teaching him how to eat, along with the potty training, along with the, the uh, kindness and having manners and, and putting things away, along with all that, but you teach him how to think and, and how to have a mindset bent toward the Lord God Almighty, the Bible is telling us there, there's principles in that, that, that it won't return void. Now, I know, I know that there have been people that have raised their kids to the best of their ability. They've done it with godliness. They've, they, they have prayed for their child. They've done it, and they've watched their child go into a, a place like a prodigal, a place like um, a place that, that just is bringing harm and hurt and suffering into the life of their child, and it is hurtful. Some of you who are watching this today. You've experienced it, and maybe you're experience, experiencing it today. My friend, don't give up on the Lord. Don't give up on the Lord in this. Instead, pray. Put your heart into praying for that child. Love them. Put into practice those very wonderful concepts of, of sharing Christ with your loved ones, exemplifying Jesus Christ to others. And listen, hold on to these principles. These principles are powerful. These principles are powerful. That's why it tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Shema, it says that we should train up children in the way that they should go. Because if you teach them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength, and you exemplify that and you're training them to do that, they're understanding it. They're embracing it. It'll be up to them ultimately because everybody's responsible for their own life. Everyone is. Everyone is. And so they're going to be responsible for that. They're going to be held accountable for that. But you can do all that you're called to do. And I just want to say this. I am so grateful for those moms that are out there that have poured into their kids day after day, night after night, showing them love. I'm so grateful. I've had those uh, wonderful mothers, you know, if we want to use these types of uh, symbols or, or, um, or, or, or motions out there just to show, hey, I've had a lot of moms in my life, I feel like, that have come alongside me and I've watched them um, pouring into other people, pouring into their kids, pouring into me as well, and teaching about Christ. My, mom, my own mother has done that so well. I want to tell you, God bless you. Thank you for doing that. You truly, you truly make a difference in this world in a huge way. And so with that, I, I want to share with you this last point, because this last point is strong for all of us, because um, whether or not you have children, this is for the, the single ladies, for the single men that are out there, the, the children uh, that are out there, the um, whoever it might be, moms, dads, grandparents, this is a very significant point, because we all play a role in the community. We all play a role in helping people know Jesus, helping people have a relationship. I want you to see what happens with Lydia. This is so special. She urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful <laughs> to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She is telling them in this passage, she's telling them, if you found me to be a woman that is upright and godly and, and listening and hearing what you're saying and responding in the way that, that, um, that, that I should, that's Bible-based, it's truly in line with the Word of God, then come to my house and stay. She's welcoming these, these really disciples of Lord Jesus Christ and apostle into the home. And so she prevailed upon us, meaning that she took care of us. She helped us. She paved the way for something that we could not really pave. But God was using her in a mighty, mighty way. I want you to see here, 
um, a great passage found in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it up on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When people see the light in us, who do they glorify? They glorify the Lord God Almighty. Here is a woman who trusted, trusted the Lord wholeheartedly. And she was the person who was instrumental in starting the first church in Europe. She said, come to my house. Come to my house. Let's worship together. Teach my family. Let's start this thing in my home. And I truly believe, and tradition would say this, that church was started in her home because of her faithfulness and because of her trust in the Lord. Lydia trusted the Lord wholeheartedly. wholeheartedly. We see that in this passage, right? Going back to verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. She not only heard it, she really received it, she believed it, and she lived it. This was the heart of a godly woman, a godly woman. So my question to you is, have you trusted the Lord wholeheartedly? Have you surrendered your life to the Lord. So if you're watching this today and you are a, a believer, you've trusted the Lord with your, uh, for salvation, you trust the Lord for, um, for saving, uh, for the salvation from any kind of condemnation and damnation, you've been saved and you recognize that. But, but maybe there's a part that you're trying to hold back and I'm trying to, you're trying to hold on to something so that you can say, hey, th this is what I'm taking care of and, and I'm, gonna hold, I'm gonna hold God to, to maybe an arm's length so that I can do what I wanna do. And you know what's interesting about that is that when we do that, we miss all that God has for us because he's not wanting us to be a person who just says, I'll give God the leftovers. He's saying, I want all of you, deny yourself, take up your cross. Starve the old self and then come and follow me. That's being full of God. That's being full of the Holy Spirit. That's being right with the Lord God Almighty. This is what a godly mother's all about. This is what a godly woman's all about. This is what a godly man's all about. We should be people who truly are walking with the Lord God Almighty. So I also want to ask this question. Maybe you are a Christian and you are living the Lord wholeheartedly, then keep going. Right now, I'm teaching uh, about the topic of eschatology in my systematic theology courses at Mid-America. And it's the end times, right? It's the study of the end times. And we've talked about um, uh, verses dealing with the coming of the Lord, tribulation, the millennium. We've talked about the day of the Lord. We've talked about... Um, the resurrection of the dead. And of course, what happens for those who have rejected the Lord God Almighty? The Bible says they will be resurrected with their bodies, their body and the soul will be put together, reunified, I guess you would say, and they will be cast into the lake of fire. My friend, you don't have to go through that. If you're watching today and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you can give your life to Christ. You don't have to be cast in the lake of fire. You can be right with the Lord. You can be at peace with God. But what you have to do is surrender your life to him wholeheartedly. You say, well, well, Pastor Mikey, how do you do that? Oh, it's so wonderful. Here's how you do it. You realize that you're a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we also know Jesus is the Savior. The Bible says, but God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while Christ uh, while we are still sinning, Christ died for us on the cross for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And that's all done through Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, my friend, you can be saved. On this Mother's Day, you can't have a better gift 
that's given, I believe, than to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, receive the gift of eternal life. And I will tell you this, all mothers out there, all mothers would be overjoyed at the thought, all Christian mothers would be overjoyed at the thought of a child coming into the kingdom of God. And so if you're watching this today, oh, I would ask you, give your life to Christ if you haven't done so yet. Give your life to Christ. Oh, and tell somebody about it. Tell us about it. Write us, Broadway Baptist Church. Write us. Let us know that God has saved your soul because there's nothing greater than becoming a child of God and living at peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a joy it is. Hey, will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to know you. On this side of heaven, we can know you and know you fully. We can have life and have it abundantly. We thank you, Lord God, that we are not in this life alone, but we have a relationship with the Savior of the world, the creator of the world. And so, Lord, if there's somebody here listening that doesn't know Christ as a Lord and Savior, I pray today that they would surrender their life to you, put their trust in you, and let somebody know of how you've changed their lives. Father God, you said that if we call upon you, you would save us. We believe it. And Lord, we are so grateful. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, when we think about Mother's Day, right, we always want to be grateful for our mom, grateful for all that she has done. I, I've always loved Mother's Day because um, at church, it was a wonderful time just to, to celebrate certain moms because of, of where they are in their lives, who has the most kids possibly, or who has the most grandkids, or who has the uh, children that are living the farthest away, something like that. We'd always come up with gifts in church, you know, and those are always so fun to do. Um, but we want to celebrate moms, and, and we thank you so much for all that you do. We love you. We're praying for you. And may today just be a true blessing upon you. And for all those who are tuning in today, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today at Broadway Baptist Church. Um, isn't it great to serve a resurrected Lord and Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ? God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Church, as we close our service today, let's respond by just saying, no matter what, give me Jesus. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me
church and us as we go out into this week. We love you and are praying for you. God bless you. See you next time.